Praise God. Well, it's good to be here this morning because in the presence of the Lord, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Amen. Praise God for the assembly of the saints, right? Thank you, Jesus. I just first want to start off by saying thank you to, uh, for your prayers, guys, for my wife, for myself. Um, you know, I was, uh, as I was thinking about, you know, uh, all the blessings we've received from the body of Christ, uh, I couldn't help but think of that movie, It's a Wonderful Life. You see that movie before? The end of the, the movie where, you know, all of a, you know, he just thought, I'm going to lose everything, right? We're going to lose the business, lose a home, everything. And then all of a sudden, it's like people just start bringing in these love gifts. And, and it's been like that, like this faucet just that, that hasn't turned off. And, and I, and I, and I want to say this because it's, it's giving glory to God, even, even in the midst of our, uh, you know, doubts and fears and anxiety, because my wife had, had two surgeries, first surgery. Uh, during that surgery, uh, you know, you start thinking. We, had, we already had talked about it before. So, okay, she's going to be out for a while from work. Obviously, we want to really let her recover. And then you start thinking, okay, well, it's bills. We just got an, another vehicle. We got, you know, and just, and I'm praying. But at the same time, this anxiety, right? And then I just sensed the Lord as he reminded me of his word. And he just said, do, do you believe I'm going to take care of you? I'm like, well, yes, God, of course. <laughs> and just, and, and word just started coming back, you know, just the, the Lord is my shepherd, shall not want. Like, okay, God, you're going to take care of everything, right? You got this, you know, it's, it's, you're the God that's more than enough. My God shall supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And, you, and, and let me say, say this, because later on, Paul even goes on to say, you know, I've learned to be content Right in whatever situation I'm in, whether I base or abound, whether I have a lot or just a little bit. I mean, because I'm even thinking, okay, Lord, I mean, if we have to give up that car we just got or we got to go move in with mom or whatever, it's like, we'll be okay. You're, you know, the, David said, uh, I was young, now I'm old. I've, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. And so to see... God's just using you, the body of Christ, as he has. It just, thank you. Thank you for being so generous, many of you. And I'm not saying that for those that haven't given, you know. You know, I, we're content. We're blessed. And I just thank God. I said, I'm just, I'm just astounded. You know, God always has a way of amazing us, doesn't he? Right? It's just like, wow, God, above and beyond anything we could imagine or think. And so I just give all glory and praise to God. Praise God. So I want to share today, uh, my title is called Your Sanctification. We take that from Scripture. And, and we're going to start off with 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. I was originally scheduled to uh, you know, share two Sundays. So I was going to share on justification one Sunday, then sanctification the next. I'm going to, I'm going to condense it as best I can. Uh, and, I, and I thank God for Jesse who filled in last, last week so, so nicely. And so... Uh, so let's get into this. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 17. It says, For the love of Christ controls us. Don't you just love that statement? Wow, thank you, Lord. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all. They're talking about Jesus, right? He died for, for all. Therefore, all have died. That's, that's you and me. Believers. That's who it's referring to. We're dead. That, oh, that past person, right? That old person is dead. Verse 15, and he died for all that those who might, uh, that, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Okay, so we don't have to live for ourselves. We, we, we did that, right? You did that. We have experience in that. We know it didn't, didn't profit anything. It wasn't leading us into it. In fact, it, it leads to death, the Bible says. So thank God he delivers for that. We don't have to live for ourselves. Now we get to live for Christ. Verse 16, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, it's you and me. In other words, if you're born again, if you are in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So you are a new person in Christ, right? And, and sometimes we can, you know, we hear that term born again, and it just kind of maybe glosses over. Or we don't realize really the power of what Jesus did. I mean, think about that. Born again. You have a new life 
in Christ, right? You're a new person, right? And that's why Jesus, you know, he referenced that because he, he's just, he, he's, he's trying to tell Nicodemus, it's like, this is something that is only God can do, right? Born, being born again. That's why I don't like some of these statistics. Sometimes you hear statistics, right? You know, and they'll say like, well, you know, the, the rate of divorce shows that those that are born again is the same as those who are, you know, in the world. I was like, well, I'm not so sure about this term over here, born again here. I mean, because whereas we're going to talk about uh, regarding our sanctification, you know, there's, when you're born again, that means you're a new person. You're transformed. You're different, right? We don't live like the world. And, uh, and I think some, uh, you know, maybe you're not, maybe filling out those studies are not born again, right? Um, not, not to say that we can't be fallible and make mistakes and all of that stuff, but uh, I, I just think that sometimes we don't understand the gravity, the power of being born again, of Christ's work in us. Let's look at Galatians 2.20. Many of you know this scripture. I have been crucified with Christ. You've been, that's it, you're dead, right? That old person. And even goes on, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life... I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, from, I got from the Reformation Study Bible, faith is knowing God's promise, right? We got to know the promise of God, assenting to it intellectually. We got to understand it, right? Because, you know, you can have, we can call things faith, but if, you're, if it's not based on any truth, right? The Word of God, which is truth, it's like, well, what are you trusting in, right? And, and that's why I've told you before, it's, uh, there's, there's something in America, this American gospel that I really despise. It's a lot of bad teaching, a lot of stuff that is just a man-centered. You know, when you open up the scripture, and for instance, and you open up to the book of Isaiah, it's not because it's about Isaiah. Or you open up uh, uh, the book of Job, it's not because it's about Job, even though he is a character in the story. It's about God. This word is about God. It's all about him. And praise God that we get to be characters, right? We get to be part of his family that he's grafted us into, but it's about him. It's not about us. It's not about, well, let me find what scriptures I can get to get what I want, Right? And I know we're all guilty of that. Sometimes we kind of, well, let me look for some scriptures based on this need or whatever. And that's okay sometimes. Right? But how about we just go to the word and say, Lord, you speak to me. You reveal yourself to me, God. I want to know you more, Lord. Because I know as I know you more, what happens naturally, I get to know myself more. And it isn't pretty. I begin to realize how depraved I am how needy I am, how weak I am, how desperate I am for God. And that's why we got to go to the Word with that mindset. Because there's many preachers out there, sadly, in America, and they've kind of spread this throughout the world, sadly. You know, they just kind of focus, and they can, and there's some very charismatic ones, and they can get us going. I mean, I was, I was kind of listening to some, some expert of, uh, excerpt of, one of these, and it's like, man, that, that sounds, ooh, man, you can get your juices going. And it's like, wait a second, though. Is that based on truth? I mean, because it can be very stim. You've got to be careful. That's what we have to be mindful as Christians, because it sounds very, ooh, that sounds good. Yeah, but good for, good for what? Good for your flesh? Or is it feeding your soul? Is it truth? Is it, is it revealing? Is it giving us a greater revelation of who God is? Right? Because if it's doing that, okay, yes, let's go. But if it's not, if it's just feeding us and it's getting us pumped up, okay, pump, it's good, it's okay to be pumped up. It's okay to be but pumped up about the truth of who God is. Amen? And here we see how we're dead, that old person is dead, that we've been crucified with Christ. And we have to understand this because as we understand this and, and, get, and we have to pray for that understanding, you know, because we tend to leak, right? Especially we can kind of, okay, I got it. And then later on, it's like, you know, we got to be reminded and refreshed with the word of God. We got to preach ourselves the gospel every day, you know, to remind ourselves what Christ has done and how he's transformed us and is transforming us and how we have an inheritance in heaven, 
right? And we're going to read about that, how we can look forward to heaven, not, 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 not focus on this earth. You know, I was, I was uh, in, in our conversations, my wife and I, that we've had over the years, because it's not her first battle with cancer, and, you know, and, and she'll, she'll say things like, well, you know, if I go first, uh, you know, I don't want you to marry again. <laughs> and I said, well, that's kind of selfish, babe, but okay. <laughs> and, and, I said, and I said, look, honey, understand something, though. You know, yes, you've had bouts with cancer, but none of us is promised tomorrow. I could go before you, right? And you're free to marry whoever you want. <laughs> as long as they're saved, as long as they're a Christian, if you want to. She's like, oh, no, I don't want to get married and, uh, again. And I like, she says, nobody will understand me like you do. I said, okay, well, that's a nice compliment. But, but, uh, but I, I, um, you know, I, and this re it reminds me of a story. There was a a missionary, late 1800s, early 1900s, I, I forget the exact name, I don't want to butcher his name, but anyway, he was very well, came from a very wealthy family, and they went off to Africa, him and his wife, and he just gave away all his money, you know, just, you know, just, okay, we're going to go out into the mission field, and we're just going to trust God, and he, and, but he left some money aside on, if, if he were to, kind of like a life insurance policy, right, he left some money aside for his wife in case something, if he died, she's taken care of. You think, hey, it's a good husband, right? Thinking about his wife, right? Making sure she's taken care of. But without, her, without telling her that, later on she finds out and, and says like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So you're saying that if, uh, that if I go, God will take care of you. You're okay, right? But if, but, but if you were to go, you, you don't think God can take care of me? He says, no, let, let's give it away. We're not living for this stuff. We're living for God. And I thought, wow. You know, I mean, not, 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 there's very few people that would do that, right? I mean, to think about that kind of mindset. And I just thought, wow. And it just, and it just uh, reminds, and, it re, and I say that because we, we want to hold on to this life so dearly, right? I mean, and I was just, as we're going, we're at MD Anderson, right? You just think, like, wow, you just see all the people. You think, man, there's just one hospital out of all these here in this medical center. God has put within us this desire to live, doesn't, hasn't he? We don't want to die. We want to live. But sometimes we have to be careful because we have to, of course, see that through the prism of God's word and say, yes, I want to live, but I want to live for the glory of God. Amen. Right? I want to live for Jesus. Right? And I want to, get, and I want to just live with all my gusto, with all my, with, with all my soul, with all my energy that he's given me and just empty it all out. Right? I mean, I, I marvel at men like, uh, uh, like Calvin, John Calvin. You know, I was there in the hospital and just kind of listening to these podcasts and, you know, these books. And, and, and just to hear this man that just wrote the, the Institutes of Christian Theology at a very young age, just like, wow, God bless him with such an intellect and such an understanding of the word that kind of gives us an understanding of, you know, our faith, what we believe, doctrine. But yet he was a sickly man. I didn't know that. I mean, he, he just had all these health issues. But he didn't let that stop him. I mean, you talk about this, this understanding. It's like, man, we only got one life to live, right? Like the soap opera, right? <laughs> That's it, but I'm going to live for God. And he, was, and, and he would preach, like, a lot, uh, often, you know, seven days a week. And at times, you know, just in so much pain, and he would do these lectures, and he would have them, sometimes these, these men just come to his bedroom, and he'd give these lectures from the bedroom because he was so sick. And they would tell him, oh, you need a, you need a rest, Calvin, you know? And John, you need a rest, you need a... He's like, what? For, so, so when Jesus comes, he can find me being idle? I thought, wow. <laughs> Praise God for that kind of faith, that kind of life. That says, I'm going to just live it all. And I'm just going to, you know, my, my uh, wife will sometimes say, mom, she'll tell my mom, you know, slow down. You're doing all this and I don't want you to overwork yourself, mom. And I tell her, I said, sweetie, she's doing it for God. She's, she's, she's helping out this family or that family. She just wants to just... And I understand, yeah, okay, mom, you have some chest pains or whatever. You're okay, slow down. But at the same time, she's just using all her energy to say, Lord, I'm going to bless this person, that person, pray for this, you know? That's it. It's all we got, right? We're going to do it now. And so as, as we ascend in our faith, we've got to understand, uh, you know, what, who God is, who we are, and let's live for him, understanding what he's done on the cross so that we can be new people. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In verse 1, chapter 4, verse 1. 
It says, finally, then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that you, as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. Now, just that opening statement there, that, that, that's, that's pretty powerful when you think about it, right? That you receive from us how you ought to. In other words, we taught you, right? We, we gave you instruction. This is how you live, right? And how to please God, right? Which we're going to talk about a little more in just a moment. And just as you're doing, like you're doing it, you know, kudos to you, praise God, right? You're doing it. But notice the statement that you do so more and more. Right? Just like when we were sinners and just living out there for ourselves, we learned how to do that more and more, right? Thinking of new ways how to sin and thinking of new ways how to please ourselves and just gratify ourselves, right? But now we're on a different route, right? P Pastor been preaching about a path that we're on. We're on a new path, right? And so now we, we, there's more and more of God. There's more and more to do for God. There's more and more in God. And he's saying that do so more and more. Verse 2, for you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this, now listen to this, this is the will of God. How many don't want to know the will of God? Well, right here he says that this is the will of God, your sanctification. We're going to talk about that word, sanctification. And he says that you abstain from sexual morality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. See that? He's making the contrast. We know God. People that are unbelievers, they do not know God. Verse 6, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God who gives you his Holy Spirit. Now, that last statement, that's, that's pretty intense. He said, you don't, you don't listen to this. It's not me saying it. This is God. Just as I said in verse, in verse 3, right? He said, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. Now, sanctification, it's that process by which God's Holy Spirit transforms believers, our, our, our thoughts, our motives, our behavior to conform to the holiness, that purity, that separation from sin's defilement, and the beautiful character of of Christ himself. So it's that transformation of becoming holy. We could even say holification, right? And uh, we got to understand something about this. Because remember, he's, say, he's saying, you're doing good. It taught you some things, you're doing it, but now do it more and more, right? Because he's for this is the will of God, your sanctification. And the very first thing he says, because it's not, it's only, it's not only isolated to this, but the very first thing he mentions is you abstain from sexual immorality. Well, what's that? Well, fornication, right? You know, sleep, sleeping you know, with someone before, uh, having sex with someone before marriage, uh, adultery, uh, pornography, uh, you know, all these different sexual deviances, right? Um, uh, homosexuality, all that is encompassed in that. He is, you abstain from all that. That's, that's, that's the way you used to live. That was your, you know, you wanted to please yourself, whatever felt good, right? You used to, you used to do that. No, not anymore, right? Now you are, you are being sanctified. And notice what he says about this. He says, you got to know how to control your own body, right? In holiness and honor. And he says, because the Gentiles, they don't know God. And he says in verse 6 that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. You know, we got to remember those sins. And, and I, I believe that's why he mentions this right off the bat. They, you know, sometimes we think, oh, it's, it's not hurting anybody. Yeah, it is. You know, families are destroyed, you know, just broken apart because of these sexual sins. And that's why he makes a big point of emphasizing this. No, get away from that. Abstain from that. God hasn't called us to impurity. And we have to understand another thing, too. The enemy, right, the devil, and even our own sinful desires can cause us to fall into one of two different mindsets regarding our sanctification or the process of being made holy. Number one, we can become self-righteous. Kind of thinking like, yeah, I'm good. I mean, okay, oh, okay. Pastor Ronnie's talking about sanctification. Okay, now, yeah, I'm good. 
You know, I, I, do, very, I do very well, right, in my, in my Christian walk, and I, you know, I, I read the Word every day, and I pray, and I come to church, and so I'm good. Well, yeah, but you've got to be careful, because when we settle, and we become, you know, like, 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 like Paul says, when you think you stand, ooh, watch out. It's pride setting in. You know, we have to be on guard of that. Remember, that was the pride. That was that's what brought down the enemy. That's what brought down the devil was pride. Or the second thing, number two, we become so aware of our sins and feel overwhelmed, overcome, believing the lie that we can't be transformed in those areas. In other words, there may be some areas you're like, man, I've been dealing with that for a long time. You know, my anger, I'm impatient. Right? Those things where it's not the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, right? That's all part of sanctification, right? When you're walking in that, you're, uh, you know, Paul said, you're doing these things. First of all, there's no law against it, right? Because it's good. And, and not only that, he says, uh, you can't do the other things, right? If you're doing this, right, the fruit of the Spirit you automatically can't do that, right? And so he says, come on, do this, do this, right? Like he said in, in, uh, earlier on, 1 Thessalonians, do these more and more. And so we have, to, we have to defeat both of those mindsets or come to grips with those mindsets. Pride, right? That's self-righteousness. I'm good, man. I've been serving God for a long time. No, I'm pretty good, <laughs> you know? And also this sense of like, no, I know my sins. I know, man, I was just like... I guess I just got to deal with it, right? Now, I'm not, I'm not here saying that you will come to a point in your life that you will just, okay, now I'm good, right? Well, we come to perfection. We're going to be fighting sin the rest of our lives until we die or Jesus comes. But don't get out of the fight because it is a fight. It is a fight for sanctification. It is a fight for your soul. Right? That's why when in Ephesians, when, when Paul talks about the, you know, the breastplate of righteousness and all these, you know, the armor of God, that's for warfare, right? And we're going to see another scripture. He mentions also a breastplate and a, and a helmet because we're, we're in a war. We're in a war. And it's not with the world, although it's with the things of the world, but it's not against people. It's against right here. That's sin. We got to... We're going to see some scripture here, how to deal with that. Now, let's talk also about the will of God. There's two, there are primarily two different meanings of the will of God we see in scripture. Like Ephesians 1.11, when it says, Having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Now, this is known as the hidden or secret will of God. It can also be stated as a history determining will of God. But in another sense, we're going to focus on, the description of the will of God, like we just saw in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, but also in, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, where it says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. That will of God, it's the duty, right? That duty that God has announced through revelation. In other words, he's made it known to us. Come on, this is what you got to do. Right? One of the things, abstain from sexual morality. Right? Give thanks in all things. Right? So this reveal, it tells us those things that, that the Lord finds pleasing in his sight. He wills all, his, uh, he, his will as believers, uh, as children of God, become our will. When he made us born again, God gave us a desire to do his will, to please him. I mean, think about it. I mean, just go back to that born again experience. Because we had nothing to do with it. You, right? If we ought to really understand the gospel, we had nothing to do with it. When I was in that building, Building B, when it was, that was the main sanctuary all those years ago, and God just supernaturally, His Holy Spirit just, and all of a sudden, I wanted to worship the Lord. All of a sudden, as I'm listening to Scripture, it's starting to make sense, and I'm eager to listen. All of a sudden, I believe this word. That's what's amazing about being born again. Think about that. If you are truly born again, I don't have to try to convince you that this is truth. You just believe it. Amen. As it's being taught, as you're reading, you're like, that's a, that's a supernatural work of God. Amen. You know, because now, can we get some of those affirmations? 
You know, archaeology or even things where sometimes, it, oh, this kind of looks inconsistent here. And then, you know, we find, oh, okay, that's what it was. Remember years ago, there was a, and I already forget the exact reference, but I was reading, a, I think it was First Kings, and talking about the kings, and it just mentioned in one chapter of one of the books how he was king during this time, to this time, and then in the, another book, it just two different times. It's like, whoa. And I, and I specifically, Lord, why does this, it looks wrong, Lord. What, what happened here? It looks like there's an inconsistency. Can you just show me what, what, what's that about? And I kid you not. We were having this, this kind of these weekly meetings, and it was called, a, I think it was called the Truth Project, right, pastors? And um, they actually addressed that, talking about how, the, oh, yeah, they, it looks like an inconsistency here, an inconsistency, and really this is based on this calendar, and over here it's based on this other calendar. It's like, wow. <laughs> I just thought that's so awesome, because God didn't have to answer that prayer. But literally that next week, there it was. It's like, wow, God. It did, I, and I didn't have any doubt I already knew that this is truth, right? Because he made me born again to believe this word, right? But it was just so awesome how he does that. And so I encourage you, when there's something you don't understand, say, Lord, help me understand that. I believe you, but help me understand because I don't understand that. You know, and that's why it's good to get study Bibles as well, guys, right? Get those study, but get those commentaries and kind of look at different, oh, wow. That's, that's really helped me tremendously with a lot of the things that I had trouble understanding. And so I encourage you with that to just think about, wow, this, what, that process that, and, and, you know, and the flip side is true. Someone who's not born again, you can try everything you, know, you can, and we should, you know, let's, apologetics, preaching, of course, we're gonna minister, right? We're gonna share the gospel. But when they're not born again, when a person's not born again, they're not gonna believe this. Well, is this, okay. Well, okay, oh, I like that one. Yeah, because that sounds encouraging, but they're not going to take the whole, the whole counsel of God. But thank God. <laughs> thank God that he's made us born again. Amen? Thank God that he's transformed us to where I don't have to try to convince you this is true. You just know it to be so because of the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart. Amen? So we talked about sanctification, that process by which God's Holy Spirit transforms us, transforms our thoughts our motives, and our behaviors. And guys, I mentioned those three because, again, going back to that sense of self-righteousness or pride, sometimes we have to really, the, the Bible tells us to examine our hearts, right? And, Lord, and, 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 and even we should pray, Lord, examine me. You know, prove me, show me if there's anything. What, what, what needs to be cleaned up, right? And as we do that, you start thinking about, wow, these, notice those thoughts, those are not good thoughts, you know? Those are not loving thoughts. Or, okay, the thoughts, yeah, maybe they're okay. My motives. Maybe sometimes you do good things. It's like, why am I doing it? Oh, I wasn't really doing it to glorify God. I was kind of look, like, look at me. Wow, and, and, and God will just, the Holy Spirit, I'm telling you, he, he'll expose those things in us. It's that sanctifying work, the washing of the water of the word. Right? And he changes those things and even our behavior. Right? So we're not doing those things we used to do. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? The renewal of your mind. See, see where it starts for us? We're not, to, we're not to be some mindless, you know, creature. Oh, I just, oh, I love God. Yeah, praise God. But we have to, our minds need to be renewed so that we can know him better and, and know his desire and his will for us. That by testing, it says, notice this, by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Philippians 2.13, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now, aren't you glad God, God didn't just leave us alone? I mean, he's, in other words, he's still working in us. He did a tremendous work already. But now he's, do, he's, he's working in us. He is sanctifying us. He's working in you. And even before that, in verse, in verse 12, he, he, says, he tells us, work out your own salvation. What's that? That's sanctification. Right? We're, we're, we come alongside with God, and now he, he expects us. Come on, get in that war. Right? Don't fall asleep. Don't come on. Be be active. Be proactive. 
right? And, and, he, and as we do that, as we work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, what does that mean? That's just this deep, deep sense of awe. Wow, God, you were working in me? You, you saved me? You made me born again, and now you're working in me? And have you noticed how God has worked in you th thus far? I'm not the same person I used to be. And I thank God. And, you know, somebody asked John MacArthur, he's talking about that very, that very question, saying, do you sin less, John? You know, now that, you know, for, and he says, well, yeah, I mean, there's some sins that, praise God, I've, I've overcome. But you know what also happens? As you become closer to God and, and, and you know more of God, there's a deeper sense of the sin that's still there. You know, and he kind of and he kind of gave this 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 example, and I thought, yeah, that's that's pretty powerful. You know, back in the the days of the Roman Empire, often they would, if you committed murder, uh, they would strap that body onto your body, the decaying body, and so they basically they pronounce the death sentence, but you would die this slow, gruesome death, right? While this body is strapped to you, right? And and and, and MacArthur was basically saying, you know, it's like this. This longing that we have to be in heaven, to be set free from this, this body of sin. And, and you see that struggle that uh, uh, Paul talks about in, in Romans 7. It's like, oh, you know, you just kind of want to be set free from all this. It's like, I want to be in heaven because it's like, ah, you know, I still have this battle. This, and, and, and it's there. But, but that's why, thank God, he goes through in Romans 8. He says, but there is therefore no no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. <laughs> thank God. <laughs> thank God. But having said that, there's this sense of like, God, I want to be set free from this tent. I look, for the, I look forward to that day. It's like, ah, oh, it's no longer there. But in the meantime, we got to fight that fight. Okay? So we're going to look at the means of grace for sanctification. Now, how do we do this? Because unlike, unlike your salvation, in which you had nothing to do with, sanctification involves you being active, an active participant. Okay? 1 Thessalonians 4, 1, which we look at, it almost sounds like self-help. A lot of self-help books out there. Even Christian self-help books, sadly. Things that are just like, they're just, okay. It's the same thing that Oprah or somebody else would put out. It's just kind of, okay, let's put a few scriptures in there. You know, not really based on, on sound doctrine. But, however, we notice that it says how we ought to walk to please God See, the implication there that as a born-again believer, we're actually able to please God, right? When you're not saved, when, you, when you're not born again, you can't please God. You're an enemy of God. We were all there. We were enemies of God. We were sinners, right? And thank God that while we were sinners, while we were His enemies, Christ died for us, right? But that's where we were. We weren't able to please God. Now we can please God. Unbelievers can't. They please God, and they face his righteous indignation every day. That's not something you hear a lot about, right? This righteous indignation of God. Let's look at Psalms 7, verse 11. And I want us, I want us to see this because, um, as I said, something we don't really focus on as much sometimes in the American church. I mean, thank God we do here. <laughs> but there's a lot of lack of this. 7, verse 11. It says, God is a righteous judge, and a God who feels indignation every day. Did you know that? God feels indignation, and it's righteous anger. He feels every day. Wow. If a man does not repent, God will whet his sword. What does that mean? He's, gonna sh he's sharpening his sword. He's preparing his wrath, right? He has bent and readied his bow. He's prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. You know, I, I, I've, I'm sure I've read this before. But again, waiting in the hospital, listening, and I listen to uh, uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, you know, that, that famous um, sermon by Jonathan Edwards. And he mentions that scripture. It's like, whoa, wow. I heard R.C. Sproul one time say, like, you know, that he's talking about a billboard. And it said something to the effect of, God's not mad at you, right? He's like, what are you talking about? God feels indignation every day. He's angry because he's holy. And we've all forsaken him. We've gone our own ways. Just said, don't need God, right? In fact, we become enemies of God. And, and, 
You know, I even went to a Bible school. That was, that was kind of like a mantra kind of thing that, you know, was said in almost every camp meeting. God's not mad at you. He's not, he's not, he's not with this baseball bat ready to knock you upside the head. Well, he's righteously angry. He's not uncontrollably angry, like just, yeah, like some old man with a baseball bat, like, get out of my yard kind of a thing. No, God has righteous indignation. He's angry every day. That's why if you don't know the Lord, what did it say there? Repent. Turn to God. If you're a Christian and you're in a backslidden state right now, repent. Turn to God. God's, God's angry with our sin, but he's made a way to be set free from that sin. And see, we're going to look at now it, 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 that it's in Christ that we see the perfect example of a man, Jesus. Jesus being truly God and truly man, right? Walking in holiness here on earth. We're going to notice this pattern. Look at verse John 5, 19. It says, so Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, that the son does Likewise, see. So, you know, so the first thing, number one, Jesus shows us that we must look to God. We must know Him, His will, His ways, and we do that by looking where the Word of God. We got to get in the Word. <laughs> you know, it's it's not rocket science. We got to get in the Word. We got to get in the Word. We got to get in the Word. <laughs> we have to get in the Word. Okay. Number two, Jesus shows us the vitalness of secluding ourselves to God in prayer. So get in the Word, get in prayer. Like, wow, really complex stuff, right? But we got to do it. Luke 5, 15. But now even more the report about him went abroad. Talking about Jesus, his fame. Like, oh, Jesus, look, he healed this man of leprosy. That's what he had just done. And he told the guy, just go show yourself to the priest. Don't tell anybody else. And what does he do? He tells everybody else. <laughs> Which I used to think very odd. I don't know about you. You know, as a young Christian, it's like, wait a second, Jesus. Why would you tell these people, don't tell anybody, you know, what, what, what I've done for you? And what would they do? Tell everybody. Right? Just kind of, it's just this natural excitement. You know, Jesus healed me. You know, look, he's over there. Oh. And, you know, they take their sick over there too. But Jesus, don't do that. Why? Because, you know, believe it or not, guys, that was not Jesus' primary uh, reason for coming to the earth. Now, he did. He's destroying the works of the devil, right? He's bringing healing to those who were sick. He, he healed multitudes, right? Displaying his power. That they, they, they just, He said, if, in fact, if you don't believe my words, believe in the works, right? Just, I mean, how can you not make this connection? How can somebody do the, way, the things that you're doing and not be God? Open, opening blind eyes. You have to be God. But what was Jesus' mission? To die on the cross. And as, and as he's preparing for that, to teach the word, preach the word. That was his primary mission. And notice what he says here. It's, it says here, verse 16, but he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Withdraw to desolate. You know, Again, thinking about men of God, think of, you know, great pillars of faith, you know, George Mueller. When he talks about, when he, you know, in, in, in his books, excerpts about his prayer life, that he gets in that prayer closet. And one thing he says, hey, my goal every day is to get happy in God. I thought, wow, that's awesome. I just want to get happy in the Lord because he knows that drives our affections for the Lord. We want to do things as, you know, like in 1 Corinthians, right? We do things and we're doing all these good works, but we're not doing it out of our love for God and love for other people, right? He goes, that's what I do. And he also says, you know, we talked about this in the uh, uh, Experiencing God class, right? How he, he says, I, I just want to get my, myself, my selfishness, my pride, all that until it is suppressed. Well, that doesn't happen in just 30-second prayers, right? You start reading about this, you realize like, man, this guy prayed. He got hit in his face before God. Right? And that, and that should be an example. And we see it here in the life of our very Lord and Savior. Into desolate places where nobody was around. And he would pray. Jesus, the Son of God, would pray alone. Getting that strength, right, in this physical body that he was in. Guys, if, if Jesus did it, how much more do we need it? 
And, and, and let's be honest, how much, uh, I'm guilty of it too. How, how, how little of it do we do? You know, that we, we need to withdraw ourselves, pray. The word of God itself, it's full of prayers that indicate a desire for God to make us walk in holiness, to help us, to assist us, to, uh, 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 to strengthen us. We're going to look at Psalms 119, which shows us the key to walk in holiness. Knowing and understanding God's laws, His word, His truth, His testimonies, and praying with great desperation and understanding that we are dependent on God to, to, to sustain our walk in holiness. We're going to look at that. Have we read Psalms 119 before? Longest chapter in the Bible. But when I read it, I can't help but get convicted every time. We're going to see some of those verses. You're like, whoa, look at the intensity, the love for God, the desperation for the law. The law, guys, it's the word of God, right? But he keeps talking about the law. I was like, wow. And we got, and we got the law, and then we also have uh, the gospels. We also have the new covenants, right? The New Testament books of the Bible that we have to reference and how much more that just brings it all together, right? The completion of all that. But we're going to start at verse 9. It says, how can a young man keep his way pure? That's a good question. And I, and I think it's, it's, it's focused on a young man, right? But that's, that's good for all of us. How can anybody keep his way pure, right? But I think it's stressing this because as young people, right, a lot of times the hormones, right? It's like, well, it seems like impossible. I'd say, no, it's not impossible, right? That way you wouldn't ask the question. How do we do it? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart, I seek you. I let me not wander from your command. Look, notice, notice the prayer right there. There it is. It's already started. Let me not wander. Give me the grace, God. I need your help so that I don't wander away. I want to stay in this process of sanctification. I have stored up your word in my heart. There it is. Getting in the word, right? Reading the word meditating on the word, memorizing the word, right? We've got to memorize it. It's very important. I mean, when I was praying, when, again, when I was having that anxiety and praying there in the hospital, what came back? The word, right? It's the word. The Holy Spirit will remind us of that word, but we've got to put it in us. We've got to set, it, we've got to set our face to it. He says, why? That I, that I might not sin against you. I don't want to sin, Lord. I'm tired of sin. I want to live for you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me. There it is. Again, prayer. You just see this. You constant prayer, prayer, uh, statements of declarations of faith and prayer. Teach me your statutes. Help me, Lord, to understand. I understand this word. I, I, I need help. With my lips, I declare all the rules of your mouth. What do you say? I, I speak the word, right? I talk the word. In the ways of your testimonies, I delight. Now, this one just said, this is where I feel the conviction. In the ways, in the way of your testimonies, that's, that's, that's what? That's the law. I delight as much as in all riches. Now, if some of us won the lottery today, and they said, you want a million dollars, you'd be like, wow, praise God. Let's go on vacation. Let's do this. Let's get a car, a new house, whatever, right? There'd be some excitement. I mean, don't act so holy right now. Like you, would, you would be excited, right? If somebody just, here's a million dollars or even half of that right here. Poof, wow, praise God, right? I mean, even with the blessings that we've received, it's a million dollars, but it's like way more than anything we thought. It's just like, wow, I mean, my wife was in tears reading these letters and cards and all this money and, and checks. And you're like, in tears, can't talk, bless her heart right now, but just in tears, just said it all. But notice this, in your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. Is the word so delightful that you're like, man, the way people get excited about money, and even honestly, Lord, the way I could get excited if I had so much money, this, this excites me, it delights me. There's nothing like it. I mean, Peter, right? Remember when, when, when Jesus, a guy, when everybody, all these people, disciples, they're, they're abandoning, right? Guys, you're going to leave me too? What do we say? Where are we going to go, Jesus? You have the very words of life, right? Peter delighted in the word. Even though, let's be honest, even though he didn't understand everything Jesus was saying, I don't get it. What you just said about eat my, you know, eat my body and drink my, I don't. Oh, God, I understand, though, that you, that's, that's the words of life that I just don't quite get yet, right? That's why you see even here, Lord, help me, teach me your statutes, 
Verse 15, I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will, again, there it is, I will delight in your statutes. Do you delight in the law of God? Delight. He's saying it, he, he, I don't know if he's saying it by faith or he's just saying it because it is a delight. But I, I tell you, I'm, I'm not there all the time. And this is where I ask God, God, look, I want your word to be that delight. Because forgive me, God, there's some times that other things are, are, are pulling me away. So there's some times that other things, hobbies and whatever, just pull me away and they're not my delight. Lord, I want your word to be my delight. I want your word to be where, it's, where I'm just reading the word and it's just like, I'm there and don't even realize, oh my gosh, wow, it's been an hour. Been in the Word. Why? Because it's just so delightful. It's so, there's full of, you're just full of joy and the peace and it's just so good. Just eating. Look at this bread. Verse 17, deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your Word. What are you saying? Grace. God, I need your grace. Deal bountifully. With, why? That I may live. I may keep your Word. I need your grace to sustain me, to sanctify me. Verse 18, one of my favorite verses, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. Open my eyes, God. This is a believer. This is someone that's walking with God. And he's praying, open my eyes, God, that I may see the wondrous things here in your word, in your law. Right? And, and I think that's a prayer to pray every time you get in the word. Right before you're going to open up the Bible, Lord, open my eyes. I want to see wondrous things in your word. One thing I got from John Piper, he has this little acronym. It says I O U S, right? Just taking some scripture, but before it gets in the Word, I incline my heart, Lord, to You, and not to pride or any selfish motive. Oh, open my eyes that I may see wondrous things in Your law and Your Word. Yeah. You give me an undivided heart, Lord, to fear Your name, Lord, because my heart can get divided so easily. Right, where I get into this or that. Lord. Give me that undivided heart. I just want to fear you. I don't want to fear man. I don't want to go after these things. I want to fear you. And then S, Lord, satisfy me with your steadfast love. And that's a, that's a great prayer. That's a great way. Just so you can start and in, get into word, get in prayer. Just I-O-U-S, right? And, then there, and there we saw part of it. What, that was, open my eyes or I want to see wondrous things out of your law. Verse 19, I'm a sojourner on the earth. We're just passing through, guys. That's it. We're here today, gone tomorrow. So hide not your commandments from me. I need you, God. Right? Don't, don't help me. In other words, I, I want to see. I want to see, uh, Lord, your, what, your, what your word is trying to tell me. Help me understand. Verse 20. My soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. <laughs> this is so odd, isn't it? I mean, to our, our fallible mind. My soul is consumed with longing for your rules? How many long for rules? We don't long for rules, but he's saying we don't. Your rules. Your rules are not like worldly rules. But your rules are different, God. Your rules give life. Your rules help me. They, they help me not get into that pit. They help me upon a walk in this life as you want me to. Amen? Verse 21, you rebuke the insolent, a curse, uh, uh, a curse ones who wander from your commandments. Take away from me scorn and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. Even though princes sit applauding against me, your servant will meditate on your statutes. There it is, that meditation. And no, no, even though princes, in other words, you know what, no matter what challenge, whoever's coming against me, whatever's going on in my life, I'm sick or, you know, Lord, your servant, I'm going to meditate on your statutes. I'm going to think about your word and just regurgitate it and just say it and speak it and stand on it. Your testimonies, that's, that's your laws. They're my delight. They're my counselors. Oh, well, the word of God gives us counsel. Verse 25, my soul clings to the dust. Give me life according to your word. Again, that grace, Lord, I need you. I'm dying here. <laughs> you know, I'm just a human. Lord, give me life according to your word. When I told of my ways, you answered me. He answers prayer. All these things he's praying, you answer me, God. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts, and I will meditate on your wondrous works. My soul melts away for sorrow. Think about this. He's, he's someone delighting, and ah, praise God, he's got this joy, right? This delight in the Lord. My soul melts away for sorrow. You know, as Christians, guys, 
It doesn't mean that you're not going to have sorrow. It's not going to mean you're gonna, not going to have pain. You know, because some, again, the American gospel will sometimes kind of make it sound that way. I read a book once. I used to be into tennis as a, in high school. I loved tennis. I read this book about some of the tennis athletes. Uh, Andre Agassi, heard of him, right? I mean, maybe some of you haven't, but any long hair, you know, up and coming at the time. And, and uh, apparently he had this uh, Christian, well, I guess Christian, um, advisor, right? I, I think his name was Fritz, kind of funny name. And he's having this tennis match. And after this tennis match, he, he loses. And he tells his manager, he says, fire Fritz. And that just said it all right there. He, you know, it just said, you know, you know, just, he'd been told probably, it just sounds like, kind of, you know, read between the lines that, you know, you just pray and you just do this and you just, you know, you do these kind of steps and, and God will give you that victory. You're going to win the match. Oh, it didn't work. Fire Fritz. Right? It's not the way it works, guys. God is God. We win some, we lose some, but God still gives us the eternal victory. We go through challenges, right? But even in the midst of those challenges, we can have joy unspeakable. You know, we, sometimes we've, we've heard things like, God will not give you more than you can bear. You heard about Job, right? <laughs> even, even Paul, is, some of the things he went through, he says, and I went through these things and they were more than I could endure. See, but we take some scriptures out of context, you know, like where, where it does say that God will not allow you to be tempted, right? In other words, he, he does allow temptation, right? God doesn't do it, but he does allow it, and that he won't allow you more than you can bear, because he doesn't want you to sin, to fall into that. But as far as struggles, as far as challenges, tribulations, Jesus even said specifically, in this world you will have trials, tribulations, right? But he said, but be of good cheer, right? Be joyful. You're going to have troubles, but you're going to have joy. Why? Because I've overcome the world, right? We can have this, this, this strange coexistence, right? Where you can be like my wife, and, and some of you have heard, you know, testimonies or not said prayer requests this morning. People are going through stuff. Maybe you're going through something, but in the midst of that, you can have peace that surpasses all understanding. Amen? You can have joy unspeakable. Why? Just focus on him. You know, when we lost, when we lost our son, you know, Dave, and he was stillborn, all I, all I thought about, I'm just going to worship. What else can I do? And as I worshiped, I felt that. I mean, you talk about supernatural peace, joy. I'm there at the funeral, and it's like, the, like this smile. What? That's, that's just the joy of the Lord. That's supernatural. And it's all glory to him that we can go through these things. And yet, God said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Just keep your eyes on me. Keep trusting me. Keep believing. Go through this process. I'm, I'm cleaning things up in you as well. Right? Things that you didn't even know that you had. Right? Just like a, a water, maybe there's some sand on the bottom, you know, and some dirt, and the water might look clear. It's like, ooh, it's clean. But what happened? You, you start shaking that up, right? Life shakes you up a little bit, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, wow, there's some things I didn't realize were there. Why does James says, count it all joy when you go through trials of different kinds? What? Why? Because your faith, right, is persevering. It's the per for the persevering of your faith that you're just going to keep believing. I'm going to keep trusting God. People see that, they're like, whoa, not only that, as you, you endure, what's happened? You're being perfected, it says. You're coming to this perfection. God's cleaning. He is sanctifying us as we go through these things. And sometimes we, none of us, I should, you know, I should say, we don't want to go through those things, but we do. So when we do, let's embrace it. Lord, thank you. What are you trying to teach me here, God? And help me, Jesus, to keep my eyes upon you. Verse 27, let's continue. Make me understand the way of your precepts and I will meditate on your wondrous works. My soul melts away for sorrow. Strengthen me according to what? Your word, according to your truth, according to what you say about the situation, about you, who you are, Lord, that I can trust in you. You're not a man that you should lie. 
you even made a vow, even though you didn't have to make a vow, Lord, and so I know that what you say, it is, it's, it's, that's it. It's done. Verse 29, put away, put false ways far from me and graciously teach me your law. I have chosen the way of faithfulness. I have set your rules before me. I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. Let me not be put to shame. I will run in the way of your commandments. Are you running in the way of God's commandments? It's running on. And what it, when, notice though, when you enlarge my heart. In other words, I need you to give me that capacity, God, to run in your commandments, to run in your way, to please you. Let's look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. He says, if then you've been raised with Christ, what does that mean? You've been born again. Seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Right? He was, he, was, he was put to death, but he was buried, but then he rose again, and now he's seated at the right hand of God. Verse 2, set your minds on things that are, are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have what? You died, you're dead, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Verse 5, Okay, and this is us getting into that action, right? That sanctification. We talked about how we pray and we seek Him in desperation. And, and we say, Lord, I want delight, Lord, in Your law and Your truth and Your word. But look at what we need to do also. Once we got this word in us, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Wow, that's warfare, right? Put it to death. Sexual morality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry, and account of these, what? The wrath of God is coming. That bow that he's preparing, the, the sword that he's sharpening, it's coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath. Wait, wait, wait. Just, but, but God's wrath is coming. Yeah, but our wrath is not righteous, right? His, his wrath is righteous. It's holy. But we need to put away anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Verse 12, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. That's a big one, guys. I just want to pause right there for a moment. Forgiving each other. How many Christians that I see, it's like and they have these grudges. It's like, guys, go to the word. What does it say? Forgive. Why? As the Lord has forgiven you. Right? Remember the parable Jesus gave? He was for, this, this man had all this debt. And, Please forgive me for this debt. Okay, I'm going to forgive you. And then this little debt over here, the 20 bucks somebody owes him, he started, give me my 20 bucks. And the other guy finds like, what is this? I'm going to put you in jail, bud. So you also must forgive. Jesus has forgiven us. All our sins passed present and future and then we want to hold on to something oh but you don't know what they did no i don't but god does and he still expects you to forgive <laughs> i've been hurt pretty bad in my life some things i would you know i mean not, i just wouldn't share with anybody maybe closest friends but i mean you know we've all been there i think we forget it's forgiven why because god forgave me that's sanctification if you're holding on to bitterness, guys, this is one of those things that will just... Bitterness, in, in bitterness, there's pride. All of a sudden, we're acting like God. Oh, I have the power, and I just, you know what? I'm going to hold that against him. I'm not going to forgive, right? God resists the proud. That's a scary verse. He, he resists you. He opposes you. I don't want to be opposed by God, right? Verse 14, above all these... Put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. If you know, the, I mentioned a little while ago the, uh, uh, the gifts of the Spirit or the fruit of the Spirit, right? And if you look at 1 Corinthians 13, we're talking about love, 
some of those, those things that are the fruit of the Spirit are actually identified with love. Love is patient. Love is kind. And here we see, and above all these put on love, it's, that, it's the thing that binds everything together in perfect harmony. Right? That's sanctification, guys. Putting this on. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. There it is again. Let that word dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. See, we just got a whole bunch of rules. But notice the rules. They're, they're not burdensome. Let's do this. Put off those other things and let's do this. Amen? Romans 8, 12 through 13. We're almost finishing up here. It says, So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit, there it is. It's not self-help. By the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. See, we got to do these. We got to, you know, and I told the men uh, when we had one of our meetings, I said, you know, um, Sometimes when we go to the gym, some women, the way they dress, it can be very easy for me to, to fall into lust, just provocatively and all that. I'm not blaming them, but I'm just saying that that's the way God designed men. It's very easy to, you know, go down that route. And, and I will be, this is, this is, you know, because we say put to death. Well, what does that mean? Put to, how do you do that? You pray. You ask God, right? You go back to the word. And sometimes I'll pray, Lord. As I'm here, Lord, I thank you for giving me that righteous mind, that purity of thought. Help me to look away, right? Because I don't want to fall in those traps. Uh, help me to look away to stay pure before you. And whatever it is, it might be. There's other areas, right, in our, in our lives. We all hey, each have these things where we've got to say, when we come to God with that, with, that, uh, with that prayer. We come to God and, and, and with the word, Lord, you've enabled me to please you. You've enabled me to walk in purity. And so, Lord, thank you for helping me to do that. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1. For you are children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness, so then let us not sleep. In other words, wake up, right? The world wants, the devil wants to put you to sleep. He wants you to just kind of like, not, not understanding you're in a war. Just kind of like, ah, it's okay. Ah, just let it, it's okay. I mean, have these little pet sins. No, don't fall asleep as others do but let us keep awake be sober for those who sleep sleep at night and those who get drunk are drunk at night but since we belong to the day let us be sober having put on there it is the breastplate of faith and love there's warfare put it on right faith i'm going to trust god his truth his word i'm going to walk in love and for a helmet the hope of salvation this mind is being renewed according to god's truth Verse 9, for God has not destined us for wrath. Aren't you glad? It's not our destiny. But to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another. I want to end with this. Encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Because you notice that word, therefore. Because one of the reasons we meet together is to encourage one another. And praise God, I see David over here. Praise God, Adam's over here. They're serving God. They want to hear the word of God. They want to praise together. You know, Adam, you know, calling me up yesterday, how is it going? And another Adam over here, got two Adams, and he's calling, how are you doing? What are we doing? We're encouraging one another. We're praying for you, Ronnie, your wife. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And we need to do that type of stuff more and more. Reach out. Hey, I haven't seen so-and-so in a while. Or you know what? Something looks a little off. You know, I don't, you know maybe I just don't see that peace. Their, let me call them up. How are they doing? Encourage one another. We need to be vigilant. Stay awake. Don't allow yourself to get lulled into sleep. Notice the examples of a breastplate and a helmet. They're those tools of warfare. We're in a war for holiness before God. Our holiness. Remember the wicked servant who buried his talent. Remember that? That wicked servant. He just went, oh, he got this talent, got this gift from God. Um, put it aside. Went to sleep, probably took a nap. He was tired. 
we got to use our, we got to live for God, right? we got to be proactive. Therefore, let us encourage each other in the faith, in our, or our walk toward holy living. Last verse or verses here, ver- Hebrews 10, 24, 25, and let us consider how to stir up one another. In other words, be creative as God. What should I do? I don't know, Andres, I just I feel like he needs encouragement. What should I do? Jesse feels, I, I, just, I just sense something, Lord. Show me how to pray, God. Lord, I just, and stand in the gap. And, and, let, me, and, and let me call him up. Let me text him, right? Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. You know, I, pre- I appreciate Azel, my, my friend, because he's, he's already saying, like, you know, we need to get together. We need to debrief. Let's meet sometime this week for lunch. It's like, I just... I appreciate that so much. To stir one another, to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some. Talking about Christians. Some of, this is back then. You're like, what? And that all the things that church was, you know, seeing and doing and suffering persecution. And yet, they, yeah, it's the flesh, right? We got to shake that flesh off. We got to put it to death. But what do we do instead of encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near? This is the will of God, your sanctification. Your sanctification. It's his, it's his will. And he's doing it. He's faithful. He, he's doing it. He's doing it. He's the one that's willing in you. But let's take our part. Let's say, show me, Lord, the things that I've been neglecting. Maybe I've been asleep. Maybe I've been drunk on the things of this world. You know, I'm just so saturated with television or this or that and all these pleasures. Forgive me, God, because I need to be sanctified. I want to walk in. I've been neglecting the things I should be doing. And so we need to pray. Amen. We need to pray. We need to seek God. Get in the word. Get, in, get, get, get it before the face of God. Get on your knees. You know, I was so encouraged that, you know, someone comes to the church, they were posted a picture of their mom. I'm not going to say who, but they posted a picture of their mom. You just see through the crack. And mom was on her knees praying. And I thought, wow. I mean, she, you know, she's trying to close the door. Just want that. She wants to be alone. But I just, you know, what does that tell me? The daughter was saying, oh, that's my mom. I love what she's doing right now. I love that I have a mom that is seeking God. She's going, she's putting her face before God for the family. And, you know, Pastor Danny's always talking about his mom. How she, he could hear her pray. Are we doing that, those things? Let's do it. If we haven't, if we haven't done it, come on, just get on board. Amen. Right? Start doing those things we know we need to do. We've been getting too saturated with the things of this world. Let's get saturated in the word. Let's get saturated in prayer. Let's get saturated in God's presence. Amen? Let's do that. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Jesus, first of all, that we're not destined for wrath. That you absorbed all the wrath of God. That sword, that bow, the the fiery shafts, you took it all, Jesus. So we know, Lord, there's no condemnation for those of us here who are believers, for those who are in Christ Jesus. Thank you for that, Lord. And you have started us on this path, Lord, of walking in holiness. You said, be holy because I am holy. That's your command, Lord, and help us delight in this command. Help us delight in your holiness, Lord, because it's your beauty. It's what makes you so beautiful. You're so pure. Lord, you're spotless. And Lord, you're even so otherly. I mean, we can't even comprehend, Lord, the greatness. We're going to spend all eternity, Lord, just knowing you more and more and more and more and more, Lord. And so thank you, Lord, for the body of Christ here today. Thank you for sanctifying us. Thank you for revealing your will for us to sanctify us, Lord, to help us, Lord. And help us, Lord, to, if we've been asleep, to wake up. Lord, if we've been drunk on the things of this world, to sober up. Give us that spiritual coffee, the word, Lord, to wake up, Lord, in the name of Jesus, so that we can please you. And we can do it even more and more, and not get settled, and not get satisfied. But just as, even as, as Paul says, I just want more of Christ. So you should get more of you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we love you. We praise you, Father. In Jesus' name, mighty name, bless your people as we go. Thank you for blessing their families. Thank you for meeting every need. Thank you, Lord, because you are the God who satisfies. Lord, we we rejoice in you. 
Lord, as we seek you, you said, may those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who rejoice in your salvation say evermore, God is great. And so we declare, Lord, that you are great. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.